The Chessmen of Mars. Chapter 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Chessmen of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 2. At the Gale's Mercy. Tara of Helium did not return to her father's guests, but awaited in her own apartments the word from Dior Cantos, which she knew must come, begging her to return to the gardens. She would then refuse haughtily. But no appeal came from Dior Cantos. At first Tara of Helium was angry, then she was hurt, and always she was puzzled. She could not understand. Occasionally she thought of the Jed of Gathol, and then she would stamp her foot, for she was very angry indeed with Gahan. The presumption of the man! He had insinuated that he read love for him in her eyes. Never had she been so insulted and humiliated. Never had she so thoroughly hated a man. Suddenly she turned toward Uthia. "'My flying leather!' she commanded. "'But the guests!' exclaimed the slave girl. "'Your father, the warlord, will expect you to return. "'He will be disappointed,' snapped Tara of Helium. The slave hesitated. "'He does not approve of your flying alone,' she reminded her mistress. The young princess sprang to her feet and seized the unhappy slave by the shoulders, shaking her. "'You are becoming unbearable, Uthia,' she cried. "'Soon there will be no alternative than to send you to the public slave market. Then possibly you will find a master to your liking.' Tears came to the soft eyes of the slave girl. "'It is because I love you, my princess,' she said softly. Tara of Helium melted. She took the slave in her arms and kissed her. "'I have the disposition of a thoat, Uthia,' she said forgive me. I love you, and there is nothing that I would not do for you, and nothing would I do to harm you. Again, as I have so often in the past, I offer you your freedom. I do not wish my freedom, if it will separate me from you, Tara of Helium, replied Uthia. I am happy here with you. I think that I should die without you. Again the girls kissed. And you will not fly alone, then? questioned the slave. Tara of Helium laughed and pinched her companion. "'You persistent little pest!' she cried. "'Of course I shall fly. Does not Tara of Helium always do that which pleases her?' Uthia shook her head sorrowfully. "'Alas, she does,' she admitted. "'Iron is the warlord of Barsoom to the influences of all but two. In the hands of Dejah Thoris and Tara of Helium he is as potter's clay. Then run and fetch my flying leather like the sweet slave you are, directed the mistress. Far out across the ochre sea bottoms, beyond the twin cities of Helium, raced the swift flyer of Tara of Helium. Thrilling to the speed and the buoyancy and the obedience of the little craft, the girl drove toward the northwest. Why she should choose that direction she did not pause to consider perhaps because in that direction lay the least known areas of Barsoom, and ergo romance, mystery, and adventure. In that direction also lay far Gathol, but to that fact she gave no conscious thought. She did, however, think occasionally of the jet of that distant kingdom, but the reaction to these thoughts was scarcely pleasurable. They still brought a flush of shame to her cheeks and a surge of angry blood to her heart. She was very angry with the Jed of Gathol, and though she would never see him again, she was quite sure that hate of him would remain fresh in her memory forever. Mostly her thoughts revolved about another, Dior Cantos. And when she thought of him she thought also of Olvia Marthus of Hastor. Tara of Helium thought that she was jealous of the fair Olvia, and it made her very angry to think that. She was angry with Dior Cantos and herself, 
but she was not angry at all with Olvia Marthus, whom she loved, and so, of course, she was not jealous, really. The trouble was that Tara of Helium had failed for once to have her own way. Dior Contos had not come running like a willing slave when she had expected him, and, ah, here was the nub of the whole thing. Gahan, Jed of Gathol, a stranger, had been a witness to her humiliation. He had seen her unclaimed at the beginning of a great function, and he had had to come to her rescue to save her, as he doubtless thought, from the inglorious fate of a wallflower. At the recurring thought Tara of Helium could feel her whole body burning with scarlet shame, and then she went suddenly white and cold with rage, whereupon she turned her flyer about so abruptly that she was all but torn from her lashings upon the flat, narrow deck. She reached home just before dark. The guests had departed. Quiet had descended upon the palace. An hour later she joined her father and mother at the evening meal. "'You deserted us, Tara of Helium,' said John Carter. "'It is not what the guests of John Carter should expect.' "'They did not come to see me.' replied Tara of Helium. I did not ask them. They were no less your guests, replied her father. The girl rose and came and stood beside him and put her arms about his neck. My proper old Virginian, she cried, rumpling his shock of black hair. In Virginia you would be turned over your father's knee and spanked, said the man, smiling. She crept into his lap and kissed him. "'You do not love me any more,' she announced. "'No one loves me.' But she could not compose her features into a pout because bubbling laughter insisted upon breaking through. "'The trouble is there are too many who love you,' he said. "'And now there is another.' "'Indeed!' she cried. "'What do you mean? "'Gahan of Gathol has asked permission to woo you.' The girl sat up very straight and tilted her chin in the air. I would not wed with a walking diamond mine, she said. I will not have him. I told him as much, replied her father, and that you were as good as betrothed to another. He was very courteous about it, but at the same time he gave me to understand that he was accustomed to getting what he wanted, and that he wanted you very much. I suppose it will mean another war. Your mother's beauty kept helium at war for many years, and, well, Tara of Helium, if I were a young man, I should doubtless be willing to set all Barsoom afire to win you, as I still would to keep your divine mother. And he smiled across the Sorapus table, and its golden service at the undimmed beauty of Mars' most beautiful woman. Our little girl should not be troubled with such matters, said Dejah Thoris. Remember, John Carter, that you are not dealing with an earth child whose span of life would be more than half completed before a daughter of Barsoom reached actual maturity. "'But do not the daughters of Barsoom sometimes marry as early as twenty? he insisted. "'Yes, but they will still be desirable in the eyes of men after forty generations of earth folk have returned to dust. There is no hurry, at least upon Barsoom. We do not fade and decay here, as you tell me those of your planet do, though you yourself belie your own words. When the time seems proper, Tara of Helium shall wed with Dior Kantos, and until then let us give the matter no further thought. No, said the girl, the subject irks me, and I shall not marry Dior Kantos or another. I do not intend to wed. Her father and mother looked at her and smiled. When Gahan of Gathol returns, he may carry you off, said the former. He has gone? asked the girl. His flyer departs for Gathol in the morning, John Carter replied. I have seen the last of him then, remarked Tara of Helium with a sigh of relief. He says not, returned John Carter. The girl dismissed the subject with a shrug, and the conversation passed to other topics. A letter had arrived from Thuvia of Tharf, who was visiting at her father's court while Cathoris, her mate, hunted in Okar. Word had been received that the Tharks and Warhoons were again at war, or rather that there had been an engagement. For war, 
was their habitual state. In the memory of man there had been no peace between these two savage green hordes, only a single temporary truce. Two new battleships had been launched at Hastor. A little band of holy therns was attempting to revive the ancient and discredited religion of Isis, who they claimed still lived in spirit and had communicated with them. There were rumors of war from Dusar. A scientist claimed to have discovered human life on the further moon. A madman had attempted to destroy the atmosphere plant. Seven people had been assassinated in greater helium during the last ten zodes, the equivalent of an earth day. Following the meal, Dejah Thoris and the warlord played at Jitan, the Barsoomian game of chess, which is played upon a board of a hundred alternate black and orange squares. One player has twenty black pieces, the other twenty orange pieces. A brief description of the game may interest those earth readers who care for chess, and will not be lost upon those who pursue this narrative to its conclusion, since before they are done they will find that a knowledge of Jitan will add to the interest and the thrills that are in store for them. The men are placed upon the board, as in chess, upon the first two rows next the players. In order, from left to right, on the line of squares nearest the players, the Jitan pieces are warrior, padwar, dwar, flyer, chief, princess, flyer, dwar, padwar, warrior. In the next line, all are panthons, except the end pieces, which are called thoats and represent mounted warriors. The panthons, which are represented as warriors with one feather, may move one space in any direction except backward. The thoats, mounted warriors with three feathers, may move one straight and one diagonal, and may jump intervening pieces. Warriors, foot soldiers with two feathers, straight in any direction or diagonally, two spaces. Padwars, lieutenants wearing two feathers, two diagonal in any direction or combination. Dwars, captains wearing three feathers, three spaces straight in any direction or combination. Flyers, represented by a propeller with three blades, three spaces in any direction or combination, diagonally, and may jump intervening pieces. The chief, indicated by a diadem with ten jewels, three spaces in any direction, straight or diagonal. Princess, diadem with a single jewel, same as chief, and can jump intervening pieces. The game is won when a player places any of his pieces on the same square with his opponent's princess, or when a chief takes a chief. It is drawn when a chief is taken by any opposing piece other than the opposing chief, or when both sides have been reduced to three pieces or less of equal value, and the game is not terminated in the following ten moves, five apiece. This is but a general outline of the game, briefly stated. It was this game that Dejah Thoris and John Carter were playing when Tara of Helium bid them good night, retiring to her own quarters and her sleeping silks and furs. Until morning, my beloved, she called back to them as she passed from the apartment. Nor little did she guess, nor her parents, that this might indeed be the last time that they would ever set eyes upon her. The morning broke dull and gray. Ominous clouds billowed restlessly and low. Beneath them torn fragments scudded toward the northwest. From her window Tara of Helium looked out upon this unusual scene. Dense clouds seldom overcast the Barsoomian sky. At this hour of the day it was her custom to ride one of those small thoats that are the saddle animals of the red Martians, but the sight of the billowing clouds lured her to a new adventure. Uthia still slept, and the girl did not disturb her. Instead she dressed quietly, and went to the hangar upon the roof of the palace directly above her quarters where her own swift flyer was housed. She had never driven through the clouds. It was an adventure that always she had longed to experience. The wind was strong, 
and it was with difficulty that she maneuvered the craft from the hangar without accident, but once away it raced swiftly out above the twin cities. The buffeting winds caught and tossed it, and the girl laughed aloud in sheer joy of the resultant thrills. She handled the little ship like a veteran, though few veterans would have faced the menace of such a storm in so light a craft. Swiftly she rose toward the clouds, racing with the scudding streamers of the storm-swept fragments, and a moment later she was swallowed by the dense masses billowing above. Here was a new world a world of chaos, unpeopled except for herself. But it was a cold, damp, lonely world, and she found it depressing after the novelty of it had been dissipated by an overpowering sense of the magnitude of the forces surging about her. Suddenly she felt very lonely, and very cold, and very little. Hurriedly, therefore, she rose until presently her craft broke through into the glorious sunlight that transformed the upper surface of the somber element into rolling masses of burnished silver. Here it was still cold, but without the dampness of the clouds, and in the eye of the brilliant sun her spirits rose with the mounting needle of her altimeter. Gazing at the clouds now far beneath, the girl experienced the sensation of hanging stationary in mid-heaven but the whirring of her propeller, the wind beating upon her, the high figures that rose and fell beneath the glass of her speedometer, these told her that her speed was terrific. It was then that she determined to turn back. The first attempt she made above the clouds, but it was unsuccessful. To her surprise she discovered that she could not even turn against the high wind which rocked and buffeted the frail craft. Then she dropped swiftly to the dark and wind-swept zone between the hurtling clouds and the gloomy surface of the shadowed ground. Here she tried again to force the nose of the flyer back toward helium, but the tempest seized the frail thing and hurled it remorselessly about, rolling it over and over and tossing it as if it were a cork in a cataract. At last the girl succeeded in riding the flyer, perilously close to the ground. Never before had she been so close to death, yet she was not terrified. Her coolness had saved her, that and the strength of the deck lashings that held her. Traveling with the storm she was safe, but where was it bearing her? She pictured the apprehension of her father and mother when she failed to appear at the morning meal. They would find her flyer missing and they would guess that somewhere in the path of the storm it lay a wrecked and tangled mass upon her dead body, and then brave men would go out in search of her, risking their lives, and that lives would be lost in the search, she knew, for she realized now that never in her lifetime had such a tempest raged upon Barsoom. She must turn back. She must reach helium before her mad lust for thrills had cost the sacrifice of a single courageous life. She determined that greater safety and likelihood of success lay above the clouds, and once again she rose through the chilling, wind-tossed vapor. Her speed again was terrific, for the wind seemed to have increased rather than have lessened. She sought gradually to check the swift flight of her craft but though she finally succeeded in reversing her motor, the wind but carried her on as it would. Then it was that Tara of Helium lost her temper. Had her world not always bowed in acquiescence to her every wish? What were these elements that they dared to thwart her? She would demonstrate to them that the daughter of the warlord was not to be denied. They would learn that Tara of Helium might not be ruled even by the forces of nature. And so she drove her motor forward again, and then with her firm white teeth set in grim determination she drove the steering lever far down to port with the intention of forcing the nose of her craft straight into the teeth of the wind, and the wind seized the frail thing and toppled it over upon its back, and twisted and turned it and hurled it over and over. The propeller raced for an instant in an air pocket, 
and then the tempest seized it again and twisted it from its shaft, leaving the girl helpless upon an unmanageable atom that rose and fell, and rolled and tumbled, the sport of the elements she had defied. Tara of Helium's first sensation was one of surprise, that she had failed to have her own way. Then she commenced to feel concern, not for her own safety, but for the anxiety of her parents and the dangers that the inevitable searchers must face. She reproached herself for the thoughtless selfishness that had jeopardized the peace and safety of others. She realized her own grave danger, too. But she was still unterrified, as befitted the daughter of Dejah Thoris and John Carter. She knew that her buoyancy tanks might keep her afloat indefinitely, but she had neither food nor water, and she was being borne toward the least known area of Barsoom. Perhaps it would be better to land immediately and await the coming of the searchers, rather than to allow herself to be carried still farther from Helium, thus greatly reducing the chances of early discovery. But when she dropped toward the ground she discovered that the violence of the wind rendered an attempt to land tantamount to destruction, and she rose again, rapidly. Carried along a few hundred feet above the ground, she was better able to appreciate the titanic proportions of the storm than when she had flown in the comparative serenity of the zone above the clouds, for now she could distinctly see the effect of the wind upon the surface of Barsoom. The air was filled with dust and flying bits of vegetation, and when the storm carried her across an irrigated area of farmland she saw great trees and stone walls and buildings lifted high in air and scattered broadcast over the devastated country, and then she was carried swiftly on to other sights that forced in upon her conscious a rapidly growing conviction that after all Tara of Helium was a very small and insignificant and helpless person. It was quite a shock to her self-pride while it lasted, and toward evening she was ready to believe that it was going to last forever. There had been no abatement in the ferocity of the tempest, nor was there any indication of any. She could only guess at the distance she had been carried, for she could not believe in the correctness of the high figures that had been piled upon the record of her odometer. They seemed unbelievable, and yet, had she known it, they were quite true. In twelve hours she had flown, and been carried by the storm, full seven thousand hods. Just before dark she was carried over one of the deserted cities of ancient Mars. It was Torgaz, but she did not know it. Had she, she might readily have been forgiven for abandoning the last vestige of hope, for to the people of Helium Torgaz seems as remote as do the South Sea Islands to us. And still the tempest, its fury unabated, bore her on. All that night she hurtled through the dark beneath the clouds, or rose to race through the moonlit void beneath the glory of Barsoom's two satellites. She was cold and hungry, and altogether miserable but her brave little spirit refused to admit that her plight was hopeless even though reason proclaimed the truth. Her reply to reason, sometimes spoken aloud in sudden defiance, recalled the Spartan stubbornness of her sire in the face of certain annihilation. I still live. That morning there had been an early visitor at the palace of the warlord. It was Gahan, Jed of Gaithal. He had arrived shortly after the absence of Tara of Helium had been noted, and in the excitement he had remained unannounced until John Carter had happened upon him in the great reception corridor of the palace as the warlord was hurrying out to arrange for the dispatch of ships in search of his daughter. Gahan read the concern upon the face of the warlord. "'Forgive me if I intrude, John Carter,' he said. I but came to ask the indulgence of another day 
since it would be foolhardy to attempt to navigate a ship in such a storm. "'Remain, Gahan, a welcome guest, until you choose to leave us,' replied the warlord. "'But you must forgive any seeming inattention upon the part of Helium until my daughter is restored to us.' "'Your daughter? Restored? What do you mean?' exclaimed the Gatholian. "'I do not understand.' "'She is gone, together with her light flyer. That is all we know. We can only assume that she decided to fly before the morning meal and was caught in the clutches of the tempest. You will pardon me, Gahan, if I leave you abruptly. I am arranging to send ships in search of her. But Gahan, Jed of Gathol, was already speeding in the direction of the palace gate. There he leaped upon a waiting thoat, and followed by two warriors in the metal of Gathol, he dashed through the avenues of Helium toward the palace that had been set aside for his entertainment. This is the end of The Chessmen of Mars, Chapter 2, by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Recording by Tom Weiss.